incredible group of panelists today with us on what we're calling People Not Polluters, a panel to discuss the incredible fossil fuel movement that is very much alive and thriving on the planet, but very much absent from inside the halls of COP26. Right now, we all know, and science is absolutely crystal clear, that halting fossil fuels is going to help us limit warming by 1.5 degrees. The International Energy Agency, one of the most conservative organizations on the planet, has itself said that the world can no longer afford any new fossil fuel development. Yet, despite this science, countries are on a pathway to double their production of oil, gas, and coal, which puts all of our existence into threat, according to the UNEP production gap report issued last week. In all of this, it's absolutely vital to know that the fossil fuel, the term fossil fuels, is entirely absent from the Paris Agreement and the framework that we are sitting with here at COP26. Instead, uh, there is an absolute obfuscation of the fact that fossil fuels drive this emergency, and leaders here do not need to actually deal with it or address it within the treaty itself. What we are here to do today is bring fossil fuels and that fight inside the halls. And we have with us an incredible group of grassroots, grassroots activists and advocates who have spent decades fighting to halt fossil fuel extraction. I'd like to welcome each of them today and to ask them each to introduce themselves, starting with Ruth Miller on my left. Yachli du Stevak is in Chiji, to Ruth Miller Gustanish Iji, then in a Kanaga Shakun Kanash, Uchurian Slanish Ite, the Rey Kak, Suguya Stura, to Kijne Venish Kaikilanda, Shedesnaka, Heather Kendo Miller Shunkta, to Oid Miller Stukta, to Uchikinikali Kiriki. My English name is Ruth Miller, my Denny Ina name is Stevak Isen, and I'm a Denny Ina and Ashkenazi Jewish woman, born and raised in the Rey Kak on my Denny Ina homelands, otherwise known as Anchorage, Alaska. My family is from uh, Kijik Village, moving down through Bristol Bay and eventually into the city, and I am so proud to serve as the Climate Justice Director of Native Movement, an indigenous matriarchal nonprofit uh, based in Alaska, though working nationally and internationally, as well as a co-founder of the Fireweed Collective, um, a, a youth mobilization network for politically active young Alaskans. Chikinikalikiriki. Toka? Alma Takarayape, Toko Oewanko Hok Shila Makayapido. Hello, my relatives. Seize Enemy Tracks is my Lakota name. Benjamin Yuwaki is my English name. Uh, I'm a citizen of the Pueblo of Zuni and a descendant of Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa, Fort Peck Assiniboine and Sioux, and White Bear First Nations. Uh, and I represent NDN Collective as a climate justice organizer with our climate justice campaign. Uh, I also serve on Minnesota's Environmental Quality Board uh, as a member, as well as uh, on the International Red River Watershed Board. Miigwech for having me. Hi, everyone. I'm Mitzi Janelle Tan, a climate justice activist from Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines, which is the Fridays for Future of our country. I also organize with Fridays for Future MAPA, which is Most Affected Peoples and Areas. Thank you for having me. Yeah, good day, everyone. My name is Babawa Leobayonju. I'm a Nigerian, uh, and I live among the people of the Niger Delta. I'm a climate justice campaigner, campaigning with Environmental Rights Action, Friends of the Earth Nigeria. And uh, I'm also a media, media person who works on the environment and projects stories coming from the grassroots, using photography as a tool to highlight the issues in the Niger Delta. So I'm happy to be here this afternoon. Thank you. Eh, mi nombre es Osper Polo Carrasco, eh, soy miembro del Movimiento Ciudadano Frente al Cambio Climático, MOSIC, de Lima, Perú. Mi trabajo ahí es un poco la vigilancia al cumplimiento de los compromisos que firmó nuestro país en el respecto al cambio climático. Y tenemos un programa que es, es la, el programa de la campaña Energías Limpias Ya, que busca un poco exigir que acabemos con los combustibles fósiles. Hi, um, my name is uh, Osvaldo Polo. Uh, I am. I'm, my name is Alex. I'm translating for Osvaldo Polo. Uh, Osvaldo is a representative of MOSIC, the Citizens Movement for Climate Action, uh, in Peru. He's based in Lima, Peru. Uh, their organization holds the government to account 
uh, for the commitments that they make internationally on climate change. And they have a uh, program called Clean Energy Now, uh, where they follow the theme of fossil fuels and fossil fuel extraction and the transition within Peru. Caroline, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Caroline Rance. I'm a climate and energy campaigner for Friends of the Earth here in Scotland. So it's a real honour to have you all in Scotland with us. Um, but I'm also part of the Stop Cambo campaign in the UK, which is fighting a huge new oil field um, about 650 kilometres north of where we are sitting today. And Alex? Hi, I'm Alex Ravalovich. Uh, I'm the Global Director of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative. Um, I live on the land of the Muisca people in Bogota, Colombia. And the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative uh, is a, a network made up of over 900 civil society organizations from across the world, including uh, many of my, my comrades and colleagues here on this panel. Uh, who are working to see a new international agreement uh, focused on ending the expansion of the fossil fuel industry, uh, coming up with an equitable phase down of fossil fuel production uh, and resourcing a globally just transition that leaves uh, no community, country um, and worker behind. Thank you. Great. So as you can see, we have an incredible uh, cast of superstars on our panel today who can bring us perspectives about the fossil fuel resistance that is flourishing across the world. So I'd actually like to begin with Ruth and Toka. And, um, you know, I think it's especially in the United States, what's been happening is that indigenous communities have really been um, the stars at being at the front line of fighting so hard against uh, racist, colonialist, um, completely unjust actions from our U.S. government, which continues to frack and drill uh, and especially harm indigenous communities. I was hoping both of you could speak to some examples of how the fights have been, what have been the challenges, and, and what have been you know, moments of success as well. You like me to go first? Okay. Um, there's a few things that um, I feel like I'm from Minnesota, and so um, we've been fighting a, a Line 3 project uh, proposed by Enbridge and actually um, just completed construction uh, about a month ago, a little over a month ago. And, um, you know, even going back before that with DAPL, um, some of the things that we learned around um, just coalition building and what it means to um, establish relationships with those outside of our communities that are also affected by these pipelines. Um, I feel like one of the, the biggest um, things that these, or, or these companies have done, um, whether it be between tribes, tribal members, um, community members, is so division. And um, through the process of um, seeing what DAPL did uh, with respect to the emergence of an international calling out of um, people to come together and uh, stand up against these fights, we've seen how um, it's, it's, it's built this understanding of this intersectionality of uh, the struggles that we have and how they exist within our communities, um, not just the continued expansion of fossil fuel emissions, but um, how that affects our communities on the ground with missing and murdered indigenous women, uh, what that looks like in terms of food sovereignty and food security, and water quality and water access for our communities. Um, and another thing that I feel like we've learned through the process is um, uh, aspect of knowledge building and knowledge sharing. Uh, one of the things that uh, NDN Collective has been able to do and we look forward to releasing in the near future is a report on DAPL um, and the pipeline integrity or lack thereof. And um, not only just the, the, the conversation sometimes is just like what if it spills instead of when it will spill, how detrimental those impacts will be for our communities. And um, in terms of just being able to build that, that knowledge base for our community members, um, for other communities as well as policymakers, um, it really puts the uh, the energy or the, the knowledge into the um, people's hands to really utilize that as a, as a way towards um, you know uh, strengthening our messaging, strengthening um, the the facts on the ground as they exist, and um, and then how that can come to light with respect to um, getting the people in these positions of power to um, make the right decisions with respect to ending these fossil fuel projects. Mm. Absolutely, and our frontline defenders who spend their lives 
at these camps uh, are not only, you know, sacrificing um, their own personal well-being, their own safety, but they're sacrificing it for the benefit of the rest of the globe that cannot keep up with um, the overconsumption and the waste that we have come to depend on under our colonial infrastructure. So when we turn to indigenous communities, it is not only, you know, it, it is not a source of pride to be the stars of these frontline battles. We are putting our lives on the line uh, because it is our lives that will come at, at the greatest cost, first and foremost, but also because we know how much we have to save. And it is our cultures, our traditions uh, that have guided us for millennia towards uh, this responsibility and this reciprocity. So it is not only uh, for the incentive of saving our sacred sites, our, our cultural riches, um, our subsistence food sources, our traditional life ways, it is also for the benefit of the rest of the globe. Stopping fossil fuel and coal production is the singular most effective way to reduce carbon emissions. And yet we hear no um, tangible discussion of, of taking bold action on this here at the COP. Um, but it turns out that our indigenous resistances, uh, despite the fact that we're sacrificing our lives and well-being, um, are the most highly effective way to not only achieve 1.5 degrees Celsius cap, but hopefully to reach real zero of uh, carbon emissions. Um, it, the Indigenous Environmental Network has recently published a really incredible um, piece titled Indigenous Resistance Against Carbon, which emphasizes is that uh, because of indigenous resistances, um, the equivalent of at least one quarter of annual U.S. and Canadian emissions has been stopped or delayed. So it is literally because of indigenous communities that are uh, manifesting this power that are standing up to blockade these highly destructive projects that we are finally um, seeing progress. But this cannot continue to come at the expense of indigenous lives and our health and well-being. Uh, we as indigenous peoples know that this is an obligation, not an option. And yet we still see the high criminalization of our water and land defenders. Um, so the cost, the burden of responsibility on indigenous peoples is too high when we know that we are leading the pathway forward towards real sustainability and real global solutions. I come from Alaska, um, which we often call the, the modern oil colony of the U.S. empire because it is our communities on the front line of, of these development projects that are suffering first and worst from disease, from respiratory illness, cancers, reproductive disease, um, but also from the, the chronic a heartbreak of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Our crisis of the climate also lives within our bodies. Um, and so when we are, are taking to the front lines, when we are supporting blockades, but also when we are following EPA processes and working with the administrations, it is literally uh, a life or death fight uh, for our cultures. But we also know that we have the opportunity to live in our cultural riches, live in the riches of our lands, and that we do not need to be dependent on fossil fuels uh, in order to thrive. Um, you know, colonial, colonial domination stripped or tried to strip us of our cultures, our traditions, our languages, and attempted to teach us that we were poor. But we were only poor in, in U.S. currency. They then mandated that we pursue um, extractive development at the cost of our relatives, uh, our plant nation, our animal nation relatives, um, to gain the currency that was never meant for us in the first place. And so we know that it is our traditional ec ec economies of reciprocity and care. It's also also native-owned renewable energy, um, hydroelectric, uh, kelp regenerative farming, that will also lead the pathway forward. Uh, so our indigenous uh, relatives that are on the front lines of these uh, fossil fuel fights are showing us exactly what must be done here at the COP, and it is time for global leaders to listen. Thank you, Ruth and Toka, for those deeply inspiring messages to all of us. Mitzi, I want to turn to you and, you know, kind of responding to, you know, Ruth and Toka's experiences, how has the youth movement from where you're sitting in the Philippines, um, how has it also uh, articulated its resistance and what types of gains do you see it making? The youth movement, especially in the Philippines, is something that gives me so much hope and inspiration because something that we really try to take to heart in, in 
Youth Advocates for Climate Action in the Philippines is making sure that we connect with our indigenous peoples, with our small farmers, with our small fisher folks, with the people at the front lines really defending us against the multinational companies and the fossil fuel industries that are causing the climate crisis. And globally, we're seeing that more and more youth are really connecting and really learning from each other and becoming more and more intersectional and understanding that we need to have one youth global climate movement that's united and showing solidarity and understanding the different power dynamics in play, even within our own movement, so that we can make sure that we are dismantling the systems of injustice and oppression that has caused the climate crisis. And so moving forward, I think something that I'm really excited about for the youth climate movement is really becoming stronger and becoming more effective in our messaging. We've been very clear climate crisis is here. Um, we have to listen to the most affected peoples and areas, and now we're starting to focus in even more on how the fossil fuel industry is really the enemy here. They're the ones who are causing the climate crisis, and they are the ones that need to be kicked out, and that is what the youth movement are trying to focus on now. Great. Thanks, Mitzi. Wale, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> So, um, I, so while like, you have been working with grassroots organizations on the ground in Nigeria Delta to expose the horrific impacts of fossil fuel projects there, I would love it if you could actually bring us with you right now to the Niger Delta and lay out for us what is going on um, and how are movements in changing to renewable and a regenerative economy going out there. Yeah, thank you once again for, for inviting me here and thank you for my wonderful people here from the communities who are also doing this great fight. Um, the story from the Niger Delta is one that brings tears and pain to me. Um, just a few weeks before I came here, I went to see um, a site where the United Nations Environment Program recommended as in around, around 2011 that the Ogoni land is highly polluted and should be remediated and cleaned up. The Nigerian government and Shell, the major corporates, are trying their best to clean up the mess that they have prepared or they have done in the Niger Delta. But when I went there, to my greatest amazement, I started seeing the amount of money being pumped in to clean up a space that has been polluted over the years. And this caused me to the point of asking, why extract for new oil? When the ones we have already extracted for has caused pain, aches, loss of livelihood, debt, to mention a few. So the Niger Delta is a place right now is ranked among the 10 highest polluted places on earth. And it's not a lie. I wish I could show you pictures from it, but you already have seen the pictures. And tomorrow, um, the 10th marks 26 years of the de departure of Ken Sarowiwa, who was killed by the Nigerian government and share. So tomorrow, we want to join you first, before I go into anything, to raise up your voice and lift the cries of your Niger Deltans, for whom Ken Sarewa died, that tomorrow we should raise up our voice and amplify it, that say, leave the oil in the soil. We don't want new oil extracted in the Niger Delta. Now we are back to a conference. We are talking about net zero, net zero, net zero, net zero. But the truth about it is, this is giving room to the leaders including my own country leader, who has made a commitment to say by 2050, they are going to end or reduce their carbon emission. This is giving room to the world leaders all around us to extend the dates the way they like and keep polluting and causing us more pain down the line. Normally in Nigeria, by this time in November, you don't see rains anymore. But before I came here, it was raining heavily and it's still raining right now. This is not normal. It's affecting the system of our farming because they meet the small scale farmers depend on rain to, to farm and to grow their crops. But now with the changing weather, you can, they can no longer predict when it's going to stop raining, when it will start raining, when it's going to be um, sunny, when it's going to have a hamatan and the rest. Now it's impacting on our food system. And everybody is saying Africans are hungry, Nigerians are hungry. Why won't these people go hungry when they can't even predict the weather that they depend on to grow their crops? So the, the government, is just here to pay lip service to action. And this is no time for lip service. On my way here, I was listening to a podcast 
by um, Bill Gates, where all he was saying was, we need innovation, we need innovation, we need innovation. And what I've seen in the Niger Delta, where I live, the indigenous people actually do not require this so-called innovation. They have in indigenous innovation amongst themselves that they have kept over the years and that has helped them to live the kind of life they were living. So like my sister said, the development these guys are bringing to us is not the kind of development we want. Who defines what development is to us? Mm -hmm. This is a major problem we are facing as Africans and as Nigerians and indigenous people across the world. Who defines what development is? So Nigerian Deltans have been pushed to a place where they no longer have access to, to land to farm, land, water to fish. Many of them have become refugees in their own lands. It is really, really saddening. One of the communities I visited two weeks before I came here, right now nobody lives there, Goy community. Nobody lives in that place. It's totally deserted because of a spill that happened. But we're not losing hope because five months ago we got a victory, a landmark victory, uh, where four farmers from the, from the Niger Delta, three were given victory and one we are waiting is victory. They were asked, Shell was asked to pay for the damage they have done. And this fueled the climate justice group in the region. It gave us strength to understand that our fight is not in vain. And what we are standing for, one day soon as we are going to get the victory. So we are, we, we, the, the Niger Delta comrades are not giving up in this fight and we are standing to also demand because we see that this next zero plan is also going to get lands of the people who have already lost lands. They are saying they're going to plant trees and plant trees and plant trees. On which land? Which land are these guys going to plant? Where are you going to get the land to plant? If you're going to get land, is that not the farmland of the indigenous man, the community man? And you're talking about you're going to stop. So you're going to cause more problems. We have not even seen migration issues because if this begins to happen the way it's happening, the borders can't hold Africans. The truth about the borders can't hold Africans. Where are we going to go to? Where, where are we going to go to? Where are we going to go to? Which land are we going to farm on? How are we going to produce food for ourselves? How are we going to sustain our lives? Do they want us extinct? So we're not going to give up. We're going to keep up this fight to ensure that net zero is scrapped out completely and the real zero is highlighted. The people of Ogoni land who have secured the oil under the ground since the 90s should be highlighted as a people who should benefit if there's any need to benefit from this so-called carbon market because they've kept the oil in the ground for over 20 years. People like that should be applauded. People from the indigenous community who have kept their forests and made sure that nobody encroaches into it should be celebrated, should be the heroes and not the leaders in the courtroom. So today we are standing to say together that it is time to ask for true action. The time to act is now and we can't we can wait any further. Thank you. Thank you, Wale. And I wish we could all actually just, you know, I, I wish, well, we had a crowd here so that we could actually applaud um, these, these incredible uh, movement makers here. Um, and, and I think on that note, one of um, the disappointing parts about the UK presidency this year has been an incredible lack of access uh, to people. We um, are actually in a room right now with no audience members, and, and we'd like to encourage uh, hosts of next year to ensure that uh, grassroots frontline true fighters of the climate emergency actually have a room to speak to people um, with, because that's absolutely part of how we can actually move on the climate emergency if grassroots frontline warriors are connected with people and the public. I think on that note, we're going to um, move it to Osfer. And um, so the, the question for you is the, your organization, the Climate Movement Against Climate Change, has been working for more than a decade as a network of social organizations, NGOs, religious institutions, um, and activists that take action against the threat of climate change both in Peru and in the Latin American region overall. Your specific work has been focused on the renewable energy transition. And we'd love to hear more about what are the types of projects that have worked in, in your region, um, especially in activating a distributed and just energy system for those populations that are most impacted by the climate emergency. Um, bueno, en Perú um, hemos estado haciendo una campaña que se llama Energías Limpias Ya, ¿no? Eh, para um, llegar a los jóvenes, eh, para hacer entender la, 
la situación del, de lo que es malo, los combustibles fósiles en nuestro medio ambiente? Uh, we have been working uh, on a campaign for clean energy now, uh, and it's a campaign that has been engaging and bringing young people uh, into the struggle for, for a new and a just uh, energy system. Y porque en el Perú, como también en, en, en América Latina, principalmente la Amazonía, eh, hay, mucho, hay muchos proyectos extractivos de explotación de petróleo. Because uh, in Peru, uh, across America Latina, and uh, particularly in the Amazon, there are a huge number of extractive um, projects underway and being proposed. Y buscamos que los activistas den la voz de alerta sobre estos proyectos ¿no? que hacen daño al ambiente, principalmente a los bosques y a las comunidades indígenas. And so we're using our, our voice uh, to highlight the risk that this, these projects bring to, to the Amazon, uh, to the, the indigenous peoples who, who live there, um, as well as to the broader um, ecosystem. Y es por ello que el MOSIC se comenzó a impulsar una propuesta de ley al Congreso de la República de nuestro país para este, eh, exigir la transición energética ahora. Uh, and that's why our movement has uh, campaigned to introduce a new law into the National Congress of Peru um, to, to facilitate an energy transition uh, within the country. Pero nos hemos dado cuenta de que existe mucho, mucho el, es fuerte el poder económico para, um, para que estas leyes que son importantes sean aprobadas, porque políticamente en, nuestro, en, en los gobiernos existen muchas empresas corporativas que financian proyectos internos políticos en proyectos extractivos. But, uh, the political and economic power of our opponents is very great uh, in within the Congress and, and, and within the government, the economic interests who have um, extractive projects planned uh, is much greater um, their power and influence than, than the activists at the moment. Y para este próximo año vamos a seguir con, el, con este proyecto de exigir el, 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 la ley de la transición energética eh, con el apoyo de los jóvenes activistas que hemos eh, formado para exigir eh, eh, pronta cambio eh, de orientación económica por la transición justa, ecológica, ambiental y climática, ¿no? Por respeto a la vida. Um, but we believe in the coming year we will have built more power um, with our work uh, engaging communities Um, bringing in and training young people and the, the momentum of uh, young activists uh, to push again for, for the law and um, that we can realize a, a just transition and one that respects um, environmental boundaries um, and uh, the necessity of, of the support, supporting ecosystems for life. Y hay, hay mucha razón para exigir basta los combustibles fósiles uh, porque hay muchos casos de derrame petroleros, mucho en la Amazonía. Entonces, el próximo año es el Foro Social Paramazónico, eh, donde no, se juntan todos los nueve países amazónicos, y el tema ahí también va a ser la agenda, poner fin a los combustibles fósiles. Um, the, uh, fossil fuel projects uh, are not only a risk to the climate, they're a risk Um, locally as well, and the, the amount of oil spills and leakage and local pollution in the Amazon is a huge risk to the Amazon. And so um, next year in the, the Global Social Forum on the Amazon, there will be a, a focus on this question of how we end um, the extraction of fossil fuels in general. Y es importante porque nos tenemos que solidarizar con las organizaciones indígenas que están en plena lucha contra estos este, proyectos extractivos eh, que hay en, en varios países de la parte amazónica, como Ecuador, Brasil, nosotros como Perú. Entonces, necesitamos el, en, en el foro social para amazónico una estrategia de, de exigir eh, el combustible fósil bajo tierra. 
um, is important in the uh, the uh, Pan -Am Amazonic uh, social forum on um, for us to uh, build our solidarity with indigenous peoples uh, who are resisting the fossil fuel industry across the Amazon in the countries of the Amazon, like Peru, in Colombia, and Bolivia, um, and Brazil. Um, and we need to work together with them to ensure that we're keeping fossil fuels under the uh, under the ground and in the ground. Por ello es importante porque si no paramos estos proyectos extractivos, si no exigimos cambio de la matriz energética, eh, va a ser difícil que los países cumplan sus compromisos climáticos y, y nos preocupa mucho que el 2030 no se ponga fin a los combustibles fósiles. Um, and it's not only important locally, it matters globally, because if we don't uh, put an end to um, the fossil fuel industry, we won't be able to meet our climate goals. Uh, and I worry um, that we're not on track by 2030 to uh, really end the era of fossil fuels. Y ahora que estamos aquí todos, eh, sería bueno el próximo año sí, la lucha fuerte de exigir basta combustibles fósiles y defendamos la vida del planeta. No nos queda mucho tiempo. Tenemos que poner fin a esto de los combustibles fósiles. Um, uh, nos preocupa mucho la eh, que se siga contaminando y esto va alterando nuestro ecosistema, nuestra temperatura se va elevando. Entonces, eh, nos preocupa mucho también en Mosic eh, el 2030 como punto importante de la reducción de las emisiones. Por eso hay que poner fin a los combustibles fósiles. Gracias. Eh. This is a pivotal moment. While we're here, we need to redouble our efforts to, to end the, the fossil fuels. Uh, we see in Mosik, we see this decade out to 2030 as the pivotal decade uh, for ending the expansion of fossil fuels. And I'd, I'd call on everybody to join us uh, on, on ending fossil fuels and defending life. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to turn it over to Caroline right now. Uh, who should be on the screen soon. Caroline, are you there? Can you hear us? Great. Yes, I'm Wonderful, here. thank you. So the Cambo oil field um, development is a key example of uh, hypocrisy of countries that make big climate commitments while continuing to drill, drill, drill on their domestic lands. Can you give us a taste of that project and what has been the grassroots resistance to, um, uh, to that project? Sure. So, yeah, as I said, Campbell oil field is a huge new oil field in the North Sea, right up off the north coast of Scotland. And the proposal to drill this oil field has been brought forward by Shell. Um, and while he's just outlined their, um, their atrocities in the Niger Delta, um, and also by a Scottish private equity-backed company called Sicker Point Energy. And they, they applied for this just months before COP26. And it's the second largest undeveloped field in UK waters. It holds 800 million barrels of oil, and they want to start drilling this next year, just a few months after the, the spotlight of COP fades away. And the climate impacts are just, I mean, it's unthinkable. In the first phase alone, they want to drill out to 2050. Um, and the, the sort of climate impact of, of what they want to do in that first phase would be the equivalent of running 18 coal-fired power stations for a year. But they want to keep going beyond 2050 um, and take out basically as much of that 800 million barrels of oil as possible. But the thing is that Cambo is just the tip of the iceberg. It's symbolic of the UK's wider toxic relationship with fossil fuels. There's other active projects in the UK at the minute. There's communities fighting a new coal mine in the north of England, communities fighting onshore oil drilling in the south of England. Um, and of course, the UK are funding a destructive LNG gas project in Mozambique, which is displacing people from their lands. And there are, there are 30 more um, offshore projects lined up waiting for approval in the next few years, seven more onshore projects and three more coal mines. And the UK actually has a law to ensure that every last drop of oil and gas is extracted from UK reserves. It's called the, the obligation to maximise economic recovery. Um, so they talk about 
uh, you know, ensuring that all oil and gas resources are extracted that are economic uh, to extract, but they don't weigh up the costs of the, the human impact, the environmental impact of the climate crisis. And they don't factor in the costs of um, the huge subsidies. So the UK has a, a hugely favourable tax regime um, for fossil fuel companies. In the last few years, big polluters have received more money in subsidies from the UK government than they have paid back in tax. So in effect, the UK government is paying fossil fuel majors to pollute. Um, and, you know, we all know the UK's history of, of colonialism and extractivism, and they are here at COP26 trying to get countries to join their net zero club. Um, but, I mean, as Wally said, we all know net zero is not real zero. And the UK's promises are riddled with false solutions, which will allow fossil fuel expansion and production to continue for years to come. They have ludicrous proposals of um, powering our oil rigs with wind turbines um, and are really dedicated to carbon capture and storage, which we know will just allow these big companies to keep extracting for decades to come. Um, so the, the Stop Cambo campaign, it's only been going four months. Um, it's an incredible campaign made up of individuals, grassroots groups and organisations um, in Scotland and across the UK. So we're fighting the Campbell project, but we're also fighting for a ban on all new fossil fuel projects and a rapid phase out of fossil fuel production, but also crucially for a just transition um, for fossil fuel workers and their communities. So actually today in Glasgow, um, I'm calling in from our Just Transition Hub, which is an event um, which is put on today uh, by environmental groups together with the Scottish Trade Union Congress. And um, so we're working together um, to, to fight for a just transition for those affected workers and communities. Um, but yeah, the campaign in just four months has mobilised mass public, political and international pressure, tens of thousands of people together with scientists, organisations and some very high profile individuals, including the UK's own climate advisors, have been speaking out against Cambo. And in the last week, the first week of COP, we've seen UK ministers being heckled in the halls as they walk around COP26. People are asking them, you know, how are you letting this oil field go ahead? Every time a minister is uh, being interviewed on the TV, they're being asked, um, you know, how are you letting Cambo go ahead while you're hosting? COP26 right here. Um, so the people power is phenomenal and we know that we can win because people power is already winning against fossil fuels in the UK. We beat fracking uh, in Scotland and the rest of the UK. We stopped a new coal mine in the north of England and just in the last few weeks, communities have, have beaten off proposals uh, to start new onshore oil drilling. Um, so people power is really winning uh, here and, and it's incredible to see all of the, the amazing resistance that's happening across the world as well. And, and we know that we have to fight and we have to stand up and show the real solutions because that's not going to come from the top down. Great. Thank you, Caroline. Alex, I think we'll, we'll turn it to you um, on, on this first round of questions and you know, people here are definitely focused on a lot of on the ground projects in specific and, and the, um, the momentum is tremendous. And I think in your work, you're working on a different type of framework. Uh, how, I guess, you know, given that work, how can, in your view, can we scale up resistance on a global level to meet this challenge? Um, thank you, Jean, and, and thank you to my uh, fellow panelists. Um, for all of your, your efforts uh, and resistance, which means so much to so many people um, uh, where you are, where you are not, not yet born. Um, it's truly inspiring. And it is the local resistance to fossil fuel production, which I think inspired the Fossil Fuel Nonproliferation Treaty Initiative. Uh, the initiative uh, currently has 900 organizations from across the world. And it, and it started amongst campaigners, fossil fuel um, and environmental justice campaigners who said it's so important that we resist these projects, whether they're in the Amazon, whether they're in uh, what we call Alaska, whether they're in um, 
Nigeria or uh, whether they're in the Philippines, um, but we can't fight every single project one by one. We don't have the capacity, we don't have the time, um, and we need a global approach which sets a very clear global norm that no new fossil fuels can be built and that we need to phase out the existing production in an equitable way. Uh, and the only way that we're going to reach that level uh, of action, we believe, is by starting a new um, treaty, uh, a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, which can be agreed uh, between governments um, to set a, a global standard to, to, so that there are no new fossil fuel projects, so that we no longer need to fight um, you know, the 40 or so uh, mentioned here in the UK, the new plans uh, in the Amazon, plans across uh, Minnesota and, and other parts of what we call the United States. These are, um, every single project would be ruled out uh, under international law. And then we would build a framework for countries to negotiate um, how we equitably phase out existing production. And the key way we're going to be able to realize that is by resourcing uh, a just transition. So thinking about what are the resources that communities and countries need uh, to build alternatives uh, to a fossil fuel-based system. Um, and so the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Campaign uh, is working with our partners and, and endorsing organizations across the world to advance this demand um, as a complement uh, and, and, and building off um, the struggles of, of resistance on the ground. Um, and, we, and we hope that uh, this COP will be a starting point where more and more governments uh, begin to recognize that the existing system, uh, the UNFCCC negotiations here, don't yet have any focus on the fossil fuel production question, and it is something that is sorely missing from the international debate. Uh, and uh, I thank my panelists for bringing that to the world's attention. Thank you, Alex. So we have um, about 18 minutes left, and I was hoping we could just actually have more of a discussion so that everybody can talk to each other and kind of share share your thoughts um, on all of this. I think the question that I, I want to pose to everyone here is, you know, we, we're fighting here for this concept of climate justice, but actually climate justice is uh, a fight for justice generally. There is the same populations in this country who are suffering, obviously, from climate disasters. And as Ozver was saying, our energy system is inherently racist and colonialist, so it's the same uh, communities that are being poisoned um, by the air around them and by water threats, uh, as, as Toko was saying as well. Um, but that is also the same uh, group of communities who are the poorest of the poor. And what we're fighting here is essentially a system that is colonialist, racist, capitalist, and extractive. So given that we're up against a system, and given that we are fighting here for greater justice on the planet, how are each of you approaching that? great fight, and it, it is the fight for our existence and for the globe. And no, no order, feel free to riff off of each other and, and start going for it. All right, um, All right Wally, you're up. <laughs> um, knowledge, they say, is power. Um, so that's a very big and important tool we are using in the fight. One, we realize and we know that indigenous people have very important knowledge in their midst. So what we do with, um, while working with them is to highlight this knowledge that they possess and to strengthen it in ways that we feel should be strengthened. Um, one, these guys know, for example, when you talk about farming, they know the best farming system that works for them. And introducing to them the new concept of um, um, industrial farming, genetically modified crop introducing to their system, it's going to negate their indigenous knowledge. So what we try to do is highlight these things that they have and help them to preserve them, that they can pass them from one generation to the other. They might have been using crude methods to do it, but now we're showing them ways that they could transfer this knowledge from one generation to the other. And the other one is to make sure that we've, we, we're finding ways to teach them on how to document the issues that before them. For example, a farmer is on his way to the farm, he realizes a spill on the way, he marks the date, he marks the location, and knows this kind of information and passes it on. Because when it's time to bring out, to go to court, 
you need evidence to show in court. <laughs> so we're also training these guys on how to use little tools that they have, like their telephones, and whatever is accessible to them, to document what they have, what they're experiencing for the world to see, because we know knowledge is power. So I'll just stop here so that others can, yeah. yeah jump in and, and clarify and add as well that it's, indigenous communities have always known how to pass our knowledge generationally and it is through millennia of experimentation, rigorous indigenous science, um, data collection that doesn't look like western science but certainly has allowed our communities to thrive with our place-based methodologies for, for thousands and thousands of years and it is that same um, it is that same knowledge, those cultural resources and riches that will lead us forward so really I see it Less as you know, a, 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 it is part yes a need to amplify indigenous solutions, but really the the work that we do here, and I think many of us would say as well in coming here even to the UNFCCC, is the work of translating. You know, from our intersectional movements in Alaska, um, when we decided, um, when we well, when we uh, grew our solidarity with with um, worker justice, indigenous rights work, environmental justice, when we began exploring these frameworks uh, and and you know, started hearing the language of just transition, we knew that we needed to translate it into a way that resonated with us and our communities. And so in Alaska, uh, we call just transition kotra ethne, which in the language of the lower tenant and Dine means remembering forward. Because we are not recreating new just frameworks that have never, you know, we don't need technologies uh, to solve the climate crisis. What we need is ways of being. What we need is a principled framework that will be infused with indigenous values to, de to decide uh, our pathways forward to decide our new energy regimes um, and to ensure that they're based on, on deep reciprocity and respect. Um, and the only way to achieve that is by ingraining the free prior and informed consent of indigenous communities at all levels of decision making and development, including in new green economies, including in mining the mineral resources that will be necessary for wind farms and solar panels. And so by particularly turning towards indigenous youth, uh, who are the caretakers of this knowledge, who are the recipients of um, our generational love, it is by elevating indigenous youth to, to particularly participate in decision making that we'll begin to see a path forward. But when we come here, what we're doing is, is translating, and it is not indigenous communities that need to be educated, uh, but it is, it is our global leaders that are in so deeply in need of our education. Yeah, I want to jump in and just really I think even within the climate movement, there has to be more conversations around that translation also, because I think a lot of us who are from the Global South or from frontline communities know how it, the system is colonialist and imperialist and capitalist and all of this, and that is what brought the climate crisis about, but it's not being talked about enough, right? Even within our own movements, we haven't been able to connect really how the fossil fuel industry is so connected to the colonialism that has happened for decades. Like, People know that more or less there's exploitation happening somewhere and that's sort of connected to the climate crisis, but really as activists and as people, it's our duty also to really translate that knowledge to make sure that people outside of the movement, especially outside of the climate movement, understand that the climate crisis isn't just an environmental problem, but really a systemic one. Because so often mainstream media and leaders and these summits make it seem like it's just an environmental problem, make it seem like it's just a problem about carbon dioxide emissions and changing our energy systems. When, when we call for the dismantling of fossil fuel industry, it's not just the fossil fuel industry, but also the way that it acts, the way that it continuously just extracts from our lands and sees the earth as resource to use instead of something that we are part of. Se pueda pensar en hacer es que creo que para atacar el sistema siempre pensamos atacar el sistema de lo global, pero nunca pensamos atacar el sistema desde las entrañas políticas nacionales. ¿no? Um, when we're thinking about changing that system that, that people have been speaking about that we need to change, um, we, we can talk about changing that system globally, but we're going to need to do it nationally and, and in the, within the political systems of our countries. Por eso que ahora eh, existe esta, esta corriente de cambiar la constitución, eh, porque las constituciones 
que hoy tenemos y también como hay en otros países como en Chile, están muy pegadas a la, a la cuestión privada. And that's why uh, in South America there's a wave to change constitutions, the constitutions of countries. Uh, and for example, in Chile, uh, that's where, where that's currently peaking. Uh, they want to shift from constitutions that are focused on protecting private rights to thinking about the public good. Y que ahí les permite eh, a las corporaciones seguir haciendo sus proyectos extractivos. ¿eh? Entonces, la idea es cambiar la constitución y ponerlo más humana, más ecológica, más ambiental. ¿no? Eh, eh, esa es la, que, la tendencia que hay en, en algunos países. ¿no? Eh, y en eso va Perú también. Um, the, you know, the current model is focused on ensuring we can protect private companies' models of extraction. Uh, and what we want to change to is a more humane, um, ecological, rights-based uh, framework. That's what's happening in Chile, and Peru is also going to do that. Y como iniciativas también, como propuestas de proyectos de, de transición, también se están viendo en otros países. Por eso que es importante que, que los jóvenes, los líderes también, propongan cosas que podamos cambiar la política. Uh, it's the same with the... Um, energy transition projects, we need to find a way uh, to use them to leverage fuller political change and not just have one of projects. So young people, leaders, community leaders need to think about how we are uh, leveraging for a, a change of the system. Por eso que necesitamos forjar jóvenes activistas que vayan contra estas políticas que van contra la vida. Por eso que es importante la formación política, ambiental, climática, para hacer esos cambios dentro del contexto político. Um, and that's why it's so important that we have young people uh, joining and learning and building uh, their skills to, to change this political system, to shift the, pol the political system, to make it a system that actually respects life. Pero también hay muchas cosas que también podemos mostrar del cambio de mejor vida o natural, ¿no? Están los conocimientos ancestrales que, tienen, que las organizaciones campesinas o indígenas tienen para mostrar al norte un cambio de estilo de vida diferente, ¿no? We also need to change our own lifestyles. We do need systems change, but we also need to think about a different way of living and one that uh, sees us consuming less. Y es importante generar estos conocimientos, ¿no? Y tiene que ser parte también de una construcción, ¿no? Este, este, esta solidaridad entre el del sur y el norte, ¿no? Para encontrar estas estos, este, oportunidades de cambio, ¿no? And through solidarity, solidarity from uh, between the north, the global north and the global south, will help us find opportunities for change. También hay experiencias de de proyectos que han las comunidades indígenas como campesinas han detenido estos grandes proyectos de mineros o combustibles fósiles que puede ser una experiencia para otros. And, and we need to learn from, from the communities that have been on the front line against fossil fuel projects, um, whether it's indigenous people or uh, campesinos, small scale farmers. Y bueno, eh, Mosí va en esa, en esa tendencia, ¿no? forjando jóvenes que vayan con esa construcción de cambio, ¿no? Mosique is, is, will continue to do this work. Sí, gracias. Great. Opening it up to Caroline on the screen, if you want to jump into the discussion. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, campaigning from the UK in a wealthy developed nation with a huge historical responsibility for causing the climate crisis. We have a dual responsibility here to make sure that we're representing the, the voices of, of people in this panel from the Global South, impacted communities, to really be highlighting the UK government's hypocrisy um, and highlighting the impact of the, the decisions of the UK government on communities around the world. So that's uh, you know, a really key element for us in the Stop Campbell campaign and wider campaigns in the UK is to continually um, push forward those voices and push for climate justice. But we also need to be pushing and campaigning for, for social justice for the communities here in Scotland. So um, there are many people uh, employed in the oil and gas industry here in the UK. And um, 
the government talks a lot about just transition for these workers, but it doesn't ask those workers, you know, what what a just transition looks like for them. So it's really important for us that the transition is worker led. And we did a, a survey of workers recently and found that 91% of the workers that we spoke to had never heard the term just transition. So if these are the people who are going to be most impacted by the transition on the ground here in Scotland and the UK, and they've never heard the term, how can we ensure that the transition is going to be just and fair for them? These are the people who know their skills, their experience, where they can move to, what their communities need. Um, and we need those people to be around the table and leading the transition. So it's, it's not just enough for us to, to change the energy source. We need to change that system. If we have a, a renewable system that's still in the hands of, of the big corporates that's still exploiting land, people, workers, that's not the just energy system that we need. So we're fighting for more public control um, of energy in Scotland and across the UK that is set up in the interests and operates in the interests of people, environment and workers. Um, so yeah, I would definitely uh, encourage people just to check out the work that's being done on, on just transition by um, the partnership in Scotland between trade unions and environmentalists, because these are people coming together to really lead the way and show what workers need um, and what needs to happen on the ground to deliver that transition for workers, their families and communities. Thanks, Caroline. Token, yeah. Um, just something to thread a lot of these pieces together. Um, when I think about these systemic issues and like what needs to be changed, I think about narrative change and I think about building indigenous power. What um, Oliver had mentioned about building power and um, building in, in those political spaces. And so like some where my work first began is um, being on the Env environmental quality board meant I had a direct say in how we looked over regulations. But then as I went through that process of building advocates inside and outside, you started to realize that these regulations, as they're written, aren't written by us. They're written by corporations working to continue these extractive processes. And um, that goes towards speaking towards a, a larger mission of what it means to that education and that sharing of knowledge. Sometimes it exists within those structures where you're able to then really advocate for those regulatory statutory changes. But then what it means to also educate our relatives that are not native or not indigenous, not brown, and what it means to understand that we're not gone, we're not erased, and that our existence comes through sometimes in uh, where we have to struggle just to get our voices heard. But um, that all leads to this understanding is in COP26, there's no one in there that represents us. Um, but part of that indigenous building or that, that building of indigenous power is having people like NCAA's Fawn Sharp be the first indigenous um, US delegate. And what that means towards having a voice inside. But then when I think about building indigenous power even further, there's organizations like Advanced Native Political Leadership that are going on the ground in our communities, finding our advocates that are willing to step up and um, get elected to positions of power. And so when I think um, for our climate justice team, an idea is like dreaming the indigenous dream. But what does that mean for us is a, a replacement of having these old white men put into this position of power that directly affects our life. And what it would look like if that person was us or looked like us, represented us, represented our interests. And so um, when it comes to, build, I see building that political power as the ultimate tool to be able to have those decision makers representing us and representing what we want. Beautiful, thanks Toka. Alex, do you want to round us out with your last thoughts? Uh, thank you, Jean, and thank you, everybody on the panel. And I think the, the systemic changes that we need also go to uh, the arguments around the need for a fossil fuel treaty, because it is not only our, our system of selection about which projects we want to build that is a problem, but it's that we systemically don't respect or recognize indigenous people's rights. It's that systemically our global finance system is geared towards funding fossil fuel projects. It's that systemically our global debt finance system is geared towards uh, locking countries into fossil fuel projects to pay back 
their unjust, historic, uh, their unjust debts, financial debts, while the actual ecological debt, of course, runs the other way. Uh, and, and the system is, is also set up so the corporations, instead of being held accountable for the damages that they've done to communities and globally, instead get to sue for so-called loss of profits under investor state dispute resolution things under international um, trade law. So the, the international legal system is actually set up to support the fossil fuel industry rather than end it. Uh, and that's why we are going to need a change to that system. We're going to need an, an international non-proliferation uh, treaty regime to help us disentangle the web uh, of the fossil fuel industry, lift up uh, and support the communities most impacted by it, and bring uh, workers, their unions and communities along in designing uh, the alternative future uh, that is one that will be, as Osver said, uh, compatible with life uh, and compatible uh, with, a, with a safe climate. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Alex. I think our time is up, and I just want to give all of our panelists a, a virtual round of applause for such an enriching and spiritual conversation today, one of the best that's been at the COP. Um, so we are urging our politicians, I wouldn't call everybody a leader necessarily, to put forth people and not polluters. That is the topic of this panel and really the heart of our climate emergency right now. Thank you.